welcome to another study of faith in the Word. I am Pastor Duncans, and it's so glad, I am so glad that you joined us tonight to finish this very intense, but um, I guess I would say beneficial Bible study on faith. How many know we live in such a crazy time, and now our faith is being challenged more than before? I need you to call someone now or let them know that the uh, study in the uh, Word of Faith is on with Pastor Duncan's and let them know that we're looking at something that a lot of believers don't confess to, but this Father showed us in this third lesson of Before You Give Up. He went through a lot of motions with a lot of things coming at him. He did not give up, he did not give in, and he did not give out. So you're going through a trial right now, and I want you to learn as we get ready to pray and go into this study. I want you to turn with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. I know we've been in these verses. I'm going to try to get through them uh, tonight, and then we'll pick up this theme of before we give up or before you give up in another Bible study. But you need this word. If you're not in something right now, something is going to come where you're going to need it. And if you're fighting a temptation, you're fighting a trial. You're fighting uh, something mentally or emotionally. You're fighting against something that's happening physically. You need to know, how am I going to make it through this trial? The Father, in this lesson, can show us principles by his action of what to do. I'm talking to somebody right now. Listen, before you give up, please hear what God's word says so that you can get the victory. Let's pray. Father God, again, we thank you for allowing us to come together to hear your word. We know, God, that you have been caring for us and watching over us, and you know what we're going through right now, so we ask that you would send a fresh anointing. How privileged we are to be able to have your word, and we know the power is in your word. There's somebody listening to me, God, they're about to give up. They're at the end of their rope. They're going through, and life just is not fun, fair, or stationary. I ask you to help them as they listen to this word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin reading again at verse 9. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising or raising of the dead should mean. And they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias or Elisha must come first? And he answered and told them, Elisha ver verily cometh first and restores all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught? But I say unto you that Elias indeed come. And they had done with him whatsoever they listed, as it was written of him. And when he came down, and when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him saluted. And he asked the question. He asked the scribes, What question you with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto, unto thee my sons, which had the dumb spirit. My son, and wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground, wild and foam. And he asked the father, how long is it ago since this thing came on him? And he said, ever since he was a child, and oft times it cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believe. And straightway the father of the child cried and said with through tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Let's stop there and pick up this story. To those that are just joining us, 
we picked up this powerful story of Jesus intervening in the life of a man who was hopeless. The tragedies of our life can come in twos or threes or sixes. We'll find ourselves dealing with one thing. How many know it's true? Saved or unsaved, and something else will happen. And by the time I'm trying to wrap my brain around what's already happened, I need God to fix what's happening now. And we get to the point mentally and emotionally where we can't hold on. Don't let anybody fool you because of their title, because how long they've been saved, because they can mask with that outward demeanor. Everything is okay. Many of us have had crying nights. We've had some dark days. We had some times when it looked like our life was caught in a vice grip. But thank God, God knows how to answer that. So we're dealing with the subject tonight. We're going to pick up where Jesus called them in verse 9 uh, uh, 20, 20 uh, unbelieving generations and when Jesus called them an unbelieving generations he said how long shall I be with you and I like the fact that when, when they said when Jesus said that my disciples could not cast him out Jesus called them a faithless generation I want to stop there that's important Jesus was on the scene, delivering, blessing, healing. They saw it. They had been a part of it, just like you and I. But it still doesn't stop our flesh or our minds from swaying and going another direction. How many know we can be our worst enemy by allowing these spirits of doubt to come in and trick us? And man, by the time we turn around, and try to run back to the scriptures and get ourselves together. We've allowed some funky stuff to go through our minds. And we're further down the road lost than we were before we started. So I need you to know that we got to uh, brand in our mind these principles of how to survive before we give up. Remember we told you the sequence of this text. Now I don't want to bore those who have been in all three series. But this is after the transfiguration. Jesus was coming down. He saw the scribes and Pharisees, as they always, always did, arguing. And we found out that this man's son had been filled with a demon. And he told him, I told you disciples to cast it out. And they could not. Jesus called them an unbelieving generation. This is where we stopped last week. We were talking about the fact that belief takes more than a one-time deliverance. I need to let people know, don't let anybody fool you. Prosperity preaching is good because I believe in prosperity. But prosperity living does not happen without faith. It does not happen without a battle. You are battling and you're upset because you're battling. I don't know if it's physical or mental, whatever it is, but the reality is you're battling because the nature of our victory is in us getting stronger through the fight. As we fight, as we pull our faith in, that's when we find ourselves able to handle something today we could not handle tomorrow. Jesus could have said anything, but he called his own disciples and all the crowd that were around, some of them had been there when he had healed before, and he said, you faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? What he was saying is, I need you to understand something. If you don't trust me, none of this is going to work. There is no such thing as a one-time deliverance, and I don't have to continue to live by faith after that. Some people have gotten blindsided. We go to church, and we may stand up, we may shout and say, God answered my prayer. Just because God answered that prayer does not mean you still might not, might not have to fight that same circumstance. The devil is clear in his modus operandi. You know what he says? I will return. And if he sees you struggling, I, I tell everybody that the devil is a watcher. He's not omnipotent. He's not God. He does not have God's power, but he watches your facial expressions, your body movement. He watches to see your weak areas. He watches to see what hurts you, and then he springs an attack on you. So he knew that this man's son was the most precious thing in his life, and he wanted to see if this man was going to fall apart because his son was dying. Then he knew his disciples, the devil had watched his disciples, they followed Jesus, but he knew they didn't have the heart to do it on their own. You're going to be tested. We talked about that last week. There's going to be trying moments, but here's what you need to understand. You must trust God's word. 
Hebrews 4 and 12. I want you to write this down. I want you to be with me tonight to understand this. For the word of God, the word of God, the word comes from God, is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit, of the joints and the marrow, dividing, discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart. Did you hear what God said his word does? He discerns what you're thinking before you think it. So, how you change what you're thinking so that God looks at you and knows that what you're thinking is proper. You put the word of God on what you're going through, i.e., if you know right now I'm feeling like mentally I'm drained, emotionally I can't handle it, then you need to go in the word of God. Find some scriptures that deal with mental and emotional, uh, you know, mental and emotional balance or blessing from God. And you fix your heart and mind on that text. We got to make sure that we gird up, Peter says, the loins of our mind. It's, it's a metaphor, meaning that I got to make sure when I get up in the morning, my mind is strong enough so I don't let the weak thoughts of my mind derail my faith. You're already on your way to healing, but it won't come if your thoughts don't support it. And the only thing you got to do is trust. And somebody said, well, trust is easy. No, it's not. If it was easy, everybody would do it. Think about something. Trusting God means you have to trust God when you can't see, you can't feel sometimes, and you don't know what's going on. You have to trust God. And how do I gather that faith? Romans 10, 17. Come on. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. I'm going to say something here, and I hope nobody takes offense. But most of your losses are coming because you're not in the word of God gathering faith. Faith doesn't come from any other direction but by hearing the word of God. But remember, and you've learned this lesson, faith is an action word. We think faith sometimes is just sitting there reading something. I got that word in me. God, you're supposed to come right now. No. Faith is being able to stand. And I can tell that some of you are here now. You can put something in the chat if you agree with me. You've had to stand through some situations that you overcame before, and now you have to stand on them again. But the enemy will be relentless in bringing them back. Oh, oh my God. Because he wants you to give up. If you give up, you will fall further than you were before you started. I've been there. I'm telling you what I mean. I remember when I was fighting and going through the year that I had cancer. I was telling everyone else about how God heals. I was telling everyone else about how God blesses. And many of you, you may not know me out there, but the ones that know me, I tried to eat a, a, a diet that makes sure that it was healthy. I mean, uh, to the point where, you know, I don't eat red meat, you know, all that stuff is good. None of that stuff really keeps you, but it helps for you to try to be healthy. So I was following, I go to doctor's visits, Every year I get a full physical, I get my blood work, and that's how the enemy, I mean, that's how God was able to catch the fact that I had this precancerous condition. But I remember when it first happened, I'm sitting there saying, I've already prayed. I should be able to handle this now. I should be okay. But after I got the surgery and after I was healing, I remember those were the moments when I started going down. You know, it's easy to talk about faith when you're sitting in church or you're sitting around other people or other everybody's around you. But I got some honest people that will tell you the hardest time to hold on to Jesus' garment is when you're by yourself. When you're sitting there and the enemy is bouncing off some so what's and why didn't this happen off of your mind, it will steal your faith. And I'm sitting there and I got to tell somebody the healing sometimes is harder than the cure. Because the cure may be something that comes as a, you know, medication or operation or uh, that was fixed. But now I got to deal with the healing. It's in the healing you got to watch for infections. You don't want while the healing is going on your mind to get infected with doubts. You don't want to get infected with some things that could pull you from where you, I'm talking to somebody right now. You're sitting here listening to me and the enemy is telling you that I can get you to doubt. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But Acts 20 and 32, you need to write it down, says, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his Grace. This is the ESV version. It says, Acts 20, 32 says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to, listen, build you up and give you the inheritance 
among all those who are sanctified. Key words, Acts 20, 32. I commend you to God. If you want to get faith, go to God's word. That brings you in the presence of God. And then he said, his word of grace. His word will give you the grace you need and the strength you need to handle what you're going through, which is able. Here's the part I love about God's word. It builds us back up. You may be down right now, but you need to get that word. God's word will build you up. And when God's word builds you up, there is a blessing that comes. Somebody listen to me down. You might have tuned in just for that bit of anointed word. God said, I know your place is low. I know you're down, but I'm the God who can build your word. And when you find yourself in a position that you understand God's word has power, when you understand that God's word is the only thing that brings faith, when you understand that God's word builds you up, then you can say what Jeremiah said in the middle of his trials. Jeremiah said, your words were found and I did eat them. And your words became to me joy and the delight of my heart. There is nothing sweeter. Somebody agree with me? There is nothing sweeter than finding a word of God in your most traumatic moment. A word that jumps out at you and says not only are you going to make it, but said it reaffirms the power that God has in his word for you. Now let's pick up again at verse 20. Watch this. So that was verse 19, unbelieving generation. Go to the text. It says, so they brought him, meaning the child, follow me in the text. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into convulsion. He fell to the ground, rolled around, foaming on the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has the boy been like this? From a child, he answered, it has thrown him into the fire and the water to kill him. But if you can do anything, please have mercy on us or pity on us. Verse 23, if you can, said Jesus, you know, Jesus said that very, like, you, you got it, you got it, you got to know I can. He said, if you have faith, all things are possible to him that believes. Immediately the voice cried, this, this is so important. Here is, here's what holds this text together. This is a surprising answer. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. There is a nutshell. I'm going to deal with something that many of us don't talk about, but God was impressed. Jesus was impressed with this father, how he went from doubt to faith. He said, I do believe, but help my unbelief. He admitted that I'm dealing with some unbelief. Come on, this is important because that's how people fall down in church. You won't admit because you're around everybody else and everybody thinks you're supposed to be this and you're supposed to be all that. But many times, and the longer you go in your walk, the more you're going to have to admit to yourself, I'm wrestling with some doubts. When you don't understand that you're wrestling with doubts, you'll never be able to overcome the doubts that the enemy is bringing in your life. What do you mean wrestling? Doubt is, here's what doubt is, in case you say, well, I don't wrestle with doubts. Here it is. Lack of confidence in someone or something who promises you they can do something that is unlikely or uncommon. You have a lack of confidence in some person or something that says they're likely to do something that is unlikely or uncommon. Look what he's saying. So uh, it's like I had a friend who would not ride the roller coaster when we were growing up. And I would tell him, man, come on, trust me, that roller coaster is safe. And you know, and he, and he thought to himself, I don't have confidence in that roller coaster. And this was, he said, I just don't have confidence because I heard all the horror stories about things falling apart. Now, every, you know, you had more safe rides than you had bad rides. But you couldn't convince him because he had so much doubt that the doubt brought fear. And he said, man, I can't even look at that roller coaster. Because once you allow the doubt to come in and you have fear. So the roller coaster said, I'm going to whip you through the air at whatever, you know, 50 miles an hour. And, and you're going to not get hurt. I'm going to bring you out safely. He didn't believe it. And... What I'm telling you is a lot of times we get our promises from God, we read them, we even believe them, 
but we also have doubts about them. We won't find ourselves in a place that we can handle it. I want to talk about how you overcome your doubts. You needed this lesson, so go with me, because this, this man showed us. He said, help my unbelief. First, let's look at the cause of doubt. One of the causes of doubt is trying situations. Doubt does not come up when everything's easy. That goes without saying, right? But doubt comes in trying situations. What's funny about that is trying situations for one person is not a trying situation for another person. I like to fly. I don't like to drive. I have other folks who say, I don't want to get on an airplane. It's a trying situation. And then an airplane to me, man, I got a magazine, or I got a book I want to read, or I got something I've been wanting to write. I lay back and let somebody else do the driving. I even like catching the train. I'll get me a compartment. I'll do anything not to drive. But there's some people, all those things are trying situations for them because they're vulnerable in those situations and that's when doubt comes. It's like a hardship mentally and emotionally. But let's talk about some real trying situations. Here's where that lack of confidence in Jesus rears its head. When you're in a trying situation, it could be a physical sickness uh, that returned, you know, uh, I think one of my worst fears, I believe I can handle it, but one of my worst fears, and see, that even that language, somebody out there saying, oh, that's no, we don't listen to him. He's talking about he got some worst fears. All of us got fears. You, that's, the, that's the problem. You'll never get fixed what you don't face. I know there's some areas in my life that I fear, and I put the word of God on those areas. Can I get an amen? Quit front like you don't have any fear. That's when you're going to fall out by your fears. But I let the enemy know I might fear that, but I got a God that's greater than my fear. And I trust God. But my worst fear is when I hear cancer, if my cancer comes back. I said my worst fear, but I didn't say I was going to give up if that happens. Because I thought about it, and I know now it just means I jump back on my faith, and I make sure I tell myself I can handle it. I don't want it to happen, but if it happens, I know without a doubt I'm going into the Word of God. I'm going to stand when it's time to stand. I'm going to pray when I have to pray. I'm going to isolate myself and worship God. I'm going to get myself to a place of deliverance. Can I tell you something? Nobody else can get you to the place of deliverance. You can listen to me, but if you won't act on all those things I just told you to act on, it's not going to happen. Don't let anybody lie to you. Blessings don't come without battles. Put that in the chat, somebody. Blessings don't come without battles. You're sitting there talking about, I want my blessing. God said, well, go through the battle. How are you going to get a blessing if you don't want to battle what it is? God said, now here, here, here's, here's, the, here's the part we don't understand. Jesus won the battle, but I still have to battle to get the blessing. He won all, he won everything I needed, but for me to appropriate it, if, if, if I had an aunt who left me some money in California and I had to get those papers signed and there was a, be a reading, reading of the will and they wanted the person to be there face to face, I could tell them, well, look, man, with all this technology, you know, you send me the papers. I'll sign them technology and send it back. But no, the will stipulates this must be a face to face reading with the air. You know what I got to do? I got to get in my, on an airplane, I just told you that, some people are getting in their car, I get in that plane and I go to where I need to go and I sit there because I got to follow the directions to get my inheritance. Oh, that's good. So you're sitting there saying, I want the blessing, but I don't want to do anything for it. No, I heard God say, resist the devil and he will flee. But didn't I already win? Didn't Jesus win on the cross that the devil's supposed to flee from me? Not until you resist, because the instructions say resist the devil and he will flee. You're talking about getting a blessing that you don't have until you follow the instruction in God's word. God's word tells us if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. You want to skip the delight yourself in the Lord part. You just want the, the desires of your heart. And delighting yourself in the Lord could be a battle because of what you're going through. You're in a trying situation. So the first thing you need to understand is a trying situation will tell whether or not a financial crisis. You lose your job. One thing when you can go to the store and buy what you want is another thing when you don't have money. Perhaps somebody sues you. 
And you got to go to court. All these things. Maybe you're in a relationship and the relationship falls apart. Your wife walks out. Your, your spouse dies. Your child gets sick. Maybe you're sick. Your child dies. I'm talking about real situations that try men's soul. Here's what I want to tell you. Doubts will come, but that's when you have to learn to overcome those doubts. Let me give you a great example. Matthew chapter 11 Verse 2 to 6. If I could read to you, I'm going to tell you the story, then I'll just read the last verse. But John the Baptist was placed in prison because he told Herod he should not be with Herodias, his brother's wife. He, he, he did something that no one did. He exposed the sin of a very important person in public. So, of course, he was locked up. And if you remember the story, Herodias' daughter came to uh, and, and came to, to her mother, and her mother said, he likes your dancing. Go and, and dance before him, and he'll give you whatever you want. And she danced, and at the end, her mother said, ask for John the Baptist's head. So, you know, John the Baptist was in prison. So John the Baptist had been going out. He was a tough guy. He's the one who said, uh, remember when Jesus needed to be baptized? It was John who said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And when Jesus told him that, uh, uh, I need baptize me, he said, I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus said, we must fulfill all things that are to come. Jesus follows the word. And we found out that it was John who said, behold the Lamb. He knew it. But you know what he was doing then? He was baptizing. He was walking around evangelizing. So it wasn't as trying. But if you go to Matthew chapter 11, listen to John the Baptist in verse 2. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the Messiah we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? What? That, 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 that takes me to like one of those, one those Scooby-Doo things. Like, what? It's like, John, you're the one who knew that I was the Son of God. You're the one who said I was the Son of God. How are you now going to ask the question, um, am I the Messiah? You saw everything I did. And watch this. He heard about all the miracles. But what was happening is he was in a very trying situation. So the doubts came in his life. Jesus told him. Look what Jesus told him. I love Jesus' answer. In verse 4, he said, go back to John and tell him what you've heard, what you've seen. The blind uh, see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured. There's good needs being preached. And he said, and add, God blesses those, watch this, who don't fall away because of me. Wow, that's deep. John, who was the prophetic Elisha, got to a point where his doubts came in his mind, and he said to himself, are you the Messiah? When he knew he was the one that professed. But when you get in a trying situation, do you notice God didn't, Jesus didn't just say yes, Jesus said, live by faith. You see the things I'm able to do. You see the stuff that I've already done. That's what you got to do. And then he threw in. And John, don't give up. Blessed is the person who does not fall away. That's my word to you. Somebody put that in the chat. Don't give up. Don't give up. Jesus answered him in a way so he could see that he was the Messiah. But he also wanted him to see that you have to live this by your own Faith. It can't be something that we do. James tells us that those times when doubts come, James chapter 1, verse 2, you know the verse, consider it all joy when you fall into darkness temptation, knowing that the trying of your faith works patience. Here's what happens. When you get in a trying situation, you're going to need to be patient that God is bringing you through. So a trying situation can bring us to a place where we doubt. Here's something else. Incomplete revelation. Write it down. Another reason doubt comes in your mind is because you don't have complete revelation of what's going on. What do I mean? Uh, maybe you're in a place where you didn't pray up. Maybe you haven't been listening to the Holy Spirit. But God allows something in your life and you don't know why. You don't know what. You don't know what's going on. And you're sitting there and we were recount stuff like I pray, I go to church, I read my word. Lord, I stood up for you when they were talking about you. I went out to the streets and evangelized. God said, no, doubt comes 
Because when a difficult circumstance comes that I don't know what God is doing, I don't have the complete revelation of what God is saying, then it throws me off and I can't handle sometimes what I'm going through. It is so funny that we want to know. And that's totally in contrast a real thing. Faith does not want you to know. It wants you to trust. Now, you can know God, and that should be good enough for your faith to kick in. I, many times, I played sports, high school, college, but I remember before I was driving, 11th grade, playing varsity basketball, many a night, I would have to wait for my mother and father to pick me up. And I remember it would get dark, Sometimes my dad would call and say, I'm running a little late, I'll be there. Or my mom said, I had to run to the grocery store first, but I'm coming to get you. And they had already told me, I'm coming to pick you up. It was like, and don't get the car with nobody else. I had any cell phone to call. I wouldn't dare be disobedient and then ride home and they rode off. If they rode all the way up to the school and I wasn't there, it was not pretty. So what I did, I made sure somebody walked by and said, hey man, you want to ride? No, my mom said she's coming. I didn't know. I hadn't heard anything. They were supposed to be there 20 minutes ago, but I stayed because my mom and dad said it. And when they said it, I didn't know completely why they weren't there on time. I just knew I had to wait. That's what God's trying to get us to see. Quit fishing around for the revelation of what's going on. The children of Israel never realized they were a part of a greater purpose in God. They complain at every juncture of their journey. You know that? Right? Now, you know, we read the Old Testament now. All those lessons, it says in the Corinthians, is so we could have faith now. But they complain, we look at it. God blessed them with bread. They complained about the man. God blessed them with water. They complained when they couldn't get water when they wanted. They complained about meat falling out of the sky. What am I saying? They got to the place where they didn't have the complete revelation that God was raising up a people that were going to love him, trust him, and had special... He, sh he tried to show them, you got a special relationship with me. Uh, I got a covering over you. But when you get into this situation, you want to know what I'm doing, or you don't trust what I'm doing, or as soon as stuff gets adverse, you start accusing me of not being who I said I was. So the complete revelation is sometimes not there until God wants to reveal it. I love God. He reveals stuff after he's given us the lesson or we've grown and we've learned. Then God can tell you, this was my purpose. You ever been there where something happened and you didn't want it to happen and now you look back on life and say, I am so glad that happened because it taught me. Maybe there was a time you were disobedient. And the disobedience that you went through, somebody else did the same thing. They got caught. You didn't get caught. You were going to continue being disobedient. But then all of a sudden, them getting caught made you know, okay, I'm glad I saw what was happening because that's letting me know um, that I can do better and I better quit. Sometimes God doesn't allow us until we go through a situation to learn why he was doing it. I like to speed down the road. Oh yeah, road rage, hello. I remember one time I'm coming back from a com conference that got canceled because of weather. I'm driving from North Jersey. I'm down in South Jersey. And I'm on one of the main highways, 55. And cars in front of me are driving slow. But I like to drive fast. So I'm complaining, uh, Bob, what are you doing? I'm going to be in this snow and I'm trying to get back home. And I'm driving, it's getting dark because it was winter time. You know, when it, when it got dark earlier and I'm driving down the road, all of a sudden I make up in my mind it probably was a, was a demon. It was the devil. I decided I'm going to pass everybody. So I shot around and next thing I know, my car starts spinning around in the road. And I was up in the bank. 
If other cars had been coming in the other lane at the time I did that, I definitely would have been hit. If a tire blew out, I definitely could have died. All I'm saying is I remember being parked there saying, God, all you had to do was tell me to stop having road rage. Doing it almost killed me. But I was so glad because every now and then when I ride down the road, I'm reminded of what I went through. Amen, somebody. And it makes sure that I don't do it again. Think about Job. Job went through a situation. He didn't know what was happening to his life. Severe physical torment. Uh, severe lack of, of, of blessings. And yet, Job hung in there so much that God decided to give him double for his faithfulness. Yep, Job said, you know, I curse the day I die. But he never stopped trusting or believing in God. He was just, uh, you know, out there venting because of what he was going through. You know, God don't mind if you vent. As long as your venting is not unbelief. But he was just venting what he was going through. Here's another cause of doubt. Watch this. Worldly and satanic influence. I love this because the world is always in conflict with God. God and the world never are on the same page. You know that, don't you? So sometimes when you're trying to get out of a situation and you're comparing it to the world, the world will make you think what God's taking you through isn't fair. So you're sitting there comparing your situation to what the world says and not to what the Word says. I'm going to say that again. You're comparing your situation to what the world says and not to what the Word says. So what the world tells us sometimes, it, not sometimes, most of the time, it's enjoyable to our flesh. It's enjoyable to our mind. For instance, if God says, uh, the world says, you can have casual sex. Everybody needs a release. Everybody needs, you know, it, it's nothing. You know, we just hook up, you know, so sort of sex call, right? But here is the problem with that. The word of God said there's no such thing as casual sex. God says, whomever you hook up with, you become a part of that person. The word in Genesis is the word to know. When God said Adam knew Eve. Now, even though the word knew is talking about when they actually had sexual intercourse, but also we can take that word knew into a play on words, and it means also that every time I have sex with an individual, because they became one through that compilation, right? Every time I have sex with an individual, that's when I become a part of that individual. So pretty soon, you can go around and give parts of you away and you wonder why you don't have any self-esteem or you don't have any joy or you don't have any mental and emotional control when it comes to love and relationships because the world is telling you casual sex don't hurt. But God is saying, no, it's something that will get into your spirit, your physical body, your mind. Now, here's the problem. It's tough because that is something that also of my flesh, and it seems normal to me. It seems like this is what I should do. But but the world tells us, don't listen to God by the world. Now, the only problem is, I'm not sitting here now as a prude. I'm just telling you, anytime you deviate from the word of God, the Bible said the consequences are going to follow. How about authority in marriage and household? We live in what's called an egalitarian society. Egalitarian, meaning that, you know, ever since women suffrage, women want their rights. But we can't have two men in the house or two people hollering at one another when God says that the man is the head of the house. I see some people right now want to throw something through their computer. I know. But listen to what I'm telling you. Here's the problem. The problem is, and don't think that the man doesn't have something he has to hold on to. God says, uh, women obey your wives, obey your husbands. But it says, husbands love your wives, which is a strong edict. God says, so when he's out of whack, God will take care of that. But when you have two people in the house, both deciding, I don't need the other person. I'm grown just like you grown. I'm making my own plans. You got your plans. All of a sudden, the marriage is it's not a matter because there's no hierarchy that God said. Now, I know we can talk about this because I do relationships, but I'm just giving you an example of why some people come to me in marriage counseling because everybody's the boss and God is not. Everybody got their own desire. I got my own money. I got my own decisions. I got my own life. And so, why did you get married? But the world says, don't let nobody tell you what to do. And think about something else. Something very simple. I'll get off of that. So y'all leave me alone. Let me get back on Luke chapter 10, verse 42. Also, you got to remember the world says, they'll get on you about how much time you spend with God. Right? Think about that. 
in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 40, 42. We're still talking about dying. Now, when the man said, help my unbelief, in 10, 42, you know what he said? He said, um, Martha was upset because Mary wouldn't help with the dishes. When I first read that, I agreed with Martha. How come Martha got to cook all the chicken, fry all the chicken, cook all the collard greens, make all the sweet potatoes, and Mary's sitting there dream-eyed looking at Jesus. But Jesus said, wait a minute, listen to the text, listen to the text. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Listen to Jesus' response. It was not that it wasn't right that Mary helped him. Here's what he said to Martha. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Here's what he was saying. He said, Martha, it's not the fact that I don't want Mary to help you, but you now have been so distracted and so fearful and worried about what has to be done, you forgot the one thing that's needed. You should have come to me first and gotten peace with your situation, and the situation could have unfolded. Mary knew right now she needed me. She's chosen that part that's going to keep her life going. So it may seem unfair, but what God is saying is both of you need me. you got to figure out you can't let me tell you how often you ought to see God and nobody else to be able to tell you that you're going to church too much or you're praying too much because you know what you need, even though nobody else knows what you need. Look at, I love the fact that Caleb gives us the answer on this, first, on this part. He says, my servant Caleb, uh, because he has had a different spirit, this is Numbers chapter 14, verse 24, I will bring him into the land because he has followed me fully. There's no halfway following God. You've got to follow God fully. I told you, worldly and satanic. Well, the satanic, i got to move quickly. Genesis 3 and 4. Remember when Satan came to Jesus, came to um, Eve in the garden in Genesis 3, and Satan told her, you know, why don't you eat of that tree? And Eve said, God said, don't eat that or we'll die. In verse 4 of chapter 3, Satan said, you will not surely die. When you listen to what the world is saying, you will have doubts when God asks you to go the second mile. And the last thing about doubts, right, you need to understand is unfulfilled expectations. This is the fourth call. What does that mean? Um, God never met my needs before, so why should I believe him now? This one encompasses all of them. God's timing is not our timing. And, and I always ask people, God didn't meet your needs, yet you got enough breath to say God didn't meet your needs, yet God has met all the other needs. What you're saying is God did not meet my self-centered or my selfish need that I needed at that moment. See, sometimes we can, we can call our needs, our desires, things we want, we can say, God, that's something I need, and it may well be. But don't go around and blanketly say God didn't meet my needs because you expected God to come at 10 and he didn't come till 12. Or maybe he hasn't come yet. Remember now, the woman with the issue of blood, it was 12 years. Some people healed instantly. Other people, he didn't. Here's what I tell people with unfulfilled expectations. Enjoy the journey. One of my friends just three days ago was walking into a store, got in the parking lot, was getting ready to go in the store, stepped out of his car, and started vomiting blood. And how the story goes is he died right then in the parking lot. Sometimes we get so far off on what kind of needs God, God is meeting that we forget the things God is doing. So here we go, we're going to wrap it up. So you help my arm believe. What did the, the Father teach us about this? I love this. He taught us three things about unbelief. In his text, he said, first of all, face it. Jesus said, all things are possible. And the father said, okay, here, here's, here's the prince right now. Face your doubt. He admitted he had doubts by saying, help my unbelief. Many of us hide behind our religiosity. And, you know, I speak in tongues. I shout, I ain't going to I got no doubts. 
God covers everything for me. Quit lying. We all have to deal with doubts. Focus on Jesus. Now you can imagine, scribes were there, crowd was there, people were there, maybe the rest of me, some other family members were there, the disciples were there with their head down, but that man was looking dead at Jesus. When the doubts come, focus on Jesus. And then, while you're waiting to get rid of that doubt, fill your mind with godly expectations. Admit it, focus on Jesus, fill your mind with godly expectations and God will bless you. So, what happens when we get to that point where our blessings, Jesus said, bring the child to me and when the demon saw him and he told the man, you know, uh, I will help your unbelief, Jesus went and cast the demon out. And he sent the demon out of the young man. Let's go to the text. Let me, let me show you something in the text. In verse, and the spirit cried, and let's, let, let's start at where we, where we just came from, is verse 25. That's where we left off from 24. When Jesus saw the people come running, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deep spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, enter him no more. So what you need to do in this place, the man had to believe his relationship with God was, so strong, was getting stronger because now he could see the power of God. God said, I've done so many things in your life where you've seen my power. If you want to get to the point that you don't give up, then review the things I've done in your life. Review the power that I've given you or review the miracles and the blessings that I've already given you. I wrote this down because I started thinking about the fact that Jesus is saying now, I cast the demon out, but you have to live by faith. 1 John 5 and 4 said, Whatsoever is born of God, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Jesus said, I need you to understand you have the victory because the victory is in me. Um, I've saved you. I've kept you. I've blessed you through numerous situations. And now you're in another situation that should be nothing. All you got to do is make sure that you see my power and that means live and walk by faith. And then God tells us in Luke 17, 6, that it doesn't take much faith. He said, a mustard seed of faith can bring you through. So this father had an opportunity to see God work just like we did. He asked God to help his unbelief, and then God showed him the miracle. I need you, if you can, write in the chat a miracle God already did in your life. There's a prayer. God already answered. Take, take a sheet of paper and write all this down. Here's some. God answered when I was sick. I got well. Um, God got me another job. He helped me through when I was didn't have the money. There's numerous times in our life we can think where God supplied our needs, but when we get into a situation where we're about to give up, we forget to see God's power. Please write that down. you got to see it. I'll never forget we were going to buy um, our house and I'll never forget, I, I had been trusting God by faith. And our first house that we purchased, our bid was lower than the three top bids. But we kept confessing by faith that this was our house. We were even crazy enough, when nobody was around, to get out and walk around that house, fulfilling uh, what uh, God told Joshua, wherever your feet are, your, uh, your feet touch are on this ground, it's your ground. We, were, we walked around the house and we claimed the house. You should have heard the realtor as they kept calling, and I was talking in faith. You know, it, it's funny when you have that first impression and see that power of God. Nothing hinders you from trusting God. I remember looking at the man. He called and said, well, I'm telling you, um, Reverend Duncans, um, I was a minister, then wasn't even pastor, and I just got licensed. He said, well, I'm going to tell you. I don't know yet. I don't know how you did it, but the first couple pulled their bid back, only two ahead of you. I said, don't worry about it. That's our house. A couple days later, he called again. 
I don't know how this happened, but this person's loan didn't go through. They had a better bid, but now there's only one person ahead of you. I said, look, we might as well set up a time and we gonna meet. I was young. So that's our house. And I remember he called that last time and said, Jim, when he river no more, he got to know me. He said, look, I need you, I'll meet you and your wife at this restaurant. Come on over here and bring the money. Believe it or not, I told him I knew that was our house, but I didn't have any money. We had two small kids. He told me how much the down payment was going to be to bring. I walked to that meeting. My wife went with me, reluctantly, but I walked into that meeting with an empty briefcase. I prayed over it. I put the papers in there they sent me, and I said, I don't know how you're going to do it, God, but this is our house. Did you hear what I said? I prayed over the briefcase. I put the papers in there that we signed. And I told God, I said, God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but this is our house. We got there to the restaurant. <laughs> Marsha was looking at me, and I said, come on in, honey. She said, we don't have the money. I said, by faith, we got what we need. I remember sitting down to the man at the restaurant, at the bar. He had all the papers. He was pushing papers. Look, I need you to sign this, and then we can meet and go to closing. This you accepting the offer. And we signed this and signed that. Do you know the man said, oh, and by the way, you don't need the money tonight. Uh, we're going to call you a couple weeks. We'll call you after we set up a date. Did you hear what I, do you understand that if I didn't go to that meeting by faith, we got the house. I went to that meeting. All I had in that briefcase was faith. Sometimes people don't understand. Right now, there's been times in my life, I don't understand how my younger self did that. But I was reading God's word every day, and I was so full of faith, I knew nothing could stop me from getting the house God had promised to put my wife and my children in. And I'm telling you, faith works when you can walk by faith. And I had seen God do some great things in my life, and I just believed that God could do that for us. you got to learn when you see God's power. Write this down. Expect... A miracle. Let's not get spooky. Let's get biblical. It says, expect God to do what he said and then lock that in your mind and believe once he casts that spirit out, it's out. I believe. I got biblical uh, data, biblical proof, but I believe that many times God was doing a miracle. You saw it. But you didn't lock it in your mind, and it did you no good. You walked out of that place. Some people walked out blessed. Others walked out unblessed. God, I've seen God do a miracle in church, maybe a, a healing, or he took someone's mind that was broken and put it back together again. They walked out because they weren't willing to live by faith. I believe that broken mind came right back. Other people, they snatched it up. I know one brother who told me, as soon as I accepted God, he took the taste of liquor out of my mouth. I know another one said, he took the taste out of my mouth, but I went back and put it back in. All I'm telling you is, you still have to walk by faith. So before you give up, remember those things. And then Jesus said, this kind comes out only by prayer and fasting. This is the battle I'm talking about. Fasting and praying go together. It's not easy. I get hungrier as soon as I declare I'm fasting. I can go all day, shop, work out, not eat till 2, 30, 3 o'clock. say, oh man, I have eaten all day. But if I'm fasting and I say, I'm gonna, I get up in the morning, first thing into your mind is food. We just came off our annual fast. You got to know fasting and praying, you're entangled in a spiritual battle. You, my brother and sister, are in a spiritual battle. You need to take, take what this man did. He took his doubts to Christ. He focused on God. He believed in God. And he filled his mind with godly expectations. His son was healed so much so that he brought his son back to him blessed. God is getting ready to bless you. I'm prophesying over your life right now with the things you need. But don't think just because somebody pointed at you from television or wherever you heard it, God's getting ready to do this. Not without you confirming it, standing on faith, and living through it. Every promise you hear, I don't know who your prominent evangelists are. You can say, oh, that was good. But until you live it yourself, it does not mean a thing. Read this text again. Before you give up, 
Hear the words of Jesus. Don't be faithless. Don't let your doubts. Don't, don't keep hiding your doubts. Trust God. Believe God. Then walk by faith. Because the boy might have had another seizure that night, but the man was walking by faith. And I believe because the Bible says he's healed, he was healed. If you're looking for your healing, if you enjoyed this message, please put something in the chat and let us know. But I'm telling you, the man, write this down, didn't give up. He didn't give out. He didn't give in. And he didn't give out. He didn't give up on what he wanted. He didn't give in when the devil was pressuring him. And he did not give out. He stood in there until he got his blessing. This is Pastor Duncan saying, God bless you. Please look at the information on the screen. You want to give to a ministry? This is a powerful ministry to give to. May the Lord bless you. Oh, and by the way, all the songs you heard on our intro, go now to iTunes and pick up Now is the Time, Child of Baptist Church, and you can download songs that you heard as the intros to our Bible studies and our services. God bless you. May the Lord keep you and have a blessed day. I was down with no way up and I needed some help.